see Molly is here. It's great to see Rye, Kelly, Danielle, Michelle, and James. Welcome. Um, we're uh, May 26th, and it's uh, we're almost finished with May Madness, and we're going to enter into June Madness, which is the real, uh, you know, the the wonderful but crazy end to K-12 school year. Uh, I know, so um, very mindful of that, and want to make sure that we try to balance this all out in the best possible way. Um, in this, um, at this point in the course, um, as I was just saying a moment ago, the the major question for you is what's a topic that you feel like you can commit the next seven weeks um, to as an action research and then we start to get into how do you build the literature around that so that it can help to give you what we call a conceptual framework that is ideas that are related important ideas that are related to your topic that help you actually to 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 name it and to get some way of interpreting what the meaning is. So if you're talking about, you know, the um, anti-racism in schools, are you reading book, books of, that are related? Are, are you looking at the Tolerance Journal? Um, are you looking at, say, reading uh, Ibram Kendi's book on how to be an anti-racist? Or are you um, looking at other research that's related to the, to the topic? Um, that gives you some idea of what you would like to be talking about. Um, some people are talking about anti-racism in terms of social emotional learning, that it's not just identifying a topic, but it's identifying the, the, the kinds of behavioral responses that we have uh, and the things that occur to, to that. So it's building the topic. Um, and what I'm trying to also provide you is, is some skill building around how do you collect and analyze qualitative data, interview data, maybe observational data, maybe artifact data, that's qualitative. So those things, but primarily interviews, I find that it's important to uh, work on interview skills um, across your studies. And then we'll, uh, we'll start to talk about quantitative skills of either looking at test scores or more probably something that's more relevant is use of survey data. And generating either using surveys. Hey, Darylin, glad you could join us. Hi, Raina. So let's just uh, do that. Uh, so that's kind of what we what I have in mind. And the, the skills are going to come as you start to build out your study. Um, and that's um, one of those things where these things are going to kind of build on each other. And in some ways, uh, I, I know that that sets up a little bit of of a choice on your part. Um, hope it's not, you're, you're not feeling like frustrated. Oh, I wish I knew all this before because hey, you're, we're trying to do these things concurrently, but um, it's also going to be a matter of trying to find those right tools that are gonna fit into the work that you wanna do. So um, let me just take a minute and, and ask if there are any big topics that you want to talk about. I want to talk today about the of the interviewing process uh, that you did um, and have you break into some small groups to do that. Uh, I'll make two groups um, and I would like to have um, some time to then talk about the next step there, the data analysis. You know, what do we do with that data? Now, now that you've collected it, what do we do with it? But um, prior to that, let me just ask, are there some things that are on your mind I know uh, the, the readings are going to be um, out of the action research book. There are no other readings that I have there, but anything else that you can think of that would be something you want to get off your top of your head, sideways, no, yes, no. Um, so let me just... Yeah, okay. But yeah. I also think Rye has his hand up. Yeah, Rye? Uh, thanks, yeah. Sorry I couldn't be here, everybody. Uh, I had a athletics thing that no longer is a problem anymore, so I'll be here every time. Um, so my, my topic, Jeff, that I'm, I'm really feeling pretty passionate about is uh, best practices, DEI, DEI best practices in right. physical education. Um, maybe relate that to athletics as well. I, I mean, my broad 
topic sentence I've said is what are, what are diversity, equity, and inclusion best practices in physical education and or educationally based athletics. Um, mm -hmm. And I had two really great interview conversations with people at my school uh, just this week. And I, it, yeah, so I'd be curious about your thoughts there and maybe where I should probably try to go with that. Yeah, and, and that's a great um, start. I think the, just just in that one statement, you've, you've identified a topic and where you wanna go with that topic is, is one of those questions. Um, and it sounds like, for example, that DEI and athletics um, could go in a, in a couple of different directions, um, whether or, or PE even, you know, what, in a sense, even identifying what are the what are the connections between DEI and understanding connections between that and that might be a literature, I would say, first of all, that's a literature review question, where you would want to use those even as search words um, for a for one of the databases. Uh, and then secondly, in your discussions with uh, or your interviews, I think those will all, that will also provide you with some better idea. Is it DEI athletics in terms of coaching, DEI and athletics in terms of uh, student, um, like student behavior and student um, relationships. You know, it might be a number of different things, but that's a good point. And maybe that's a good way of us kind of, you know, we don't have so, so many people, but let's start by just hearing out how people are, uh, you know, where you're at in your thoughts about the topic and then we'll break out into groups and talk about the interviews so michelle what's your where where are you in terms of i'll, I'll just call on people if it's okay um yeah i definitely have my topic i'm very interested in best practices for bringing uh, mindfulness into schools uh, it was something we've done in uh, my first grade classroom all year and um I wanted to dig a little deeper on it because although we've been doing a mindfulness practice, it's not quite as guide, kind of like taught or guided as I would like it to be. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to um, interview, see kind of overall, like I wanted to um, get in there and interview the principal and vice principal at the school I worked at and see um, also the vice principal already uh, directed me towards a pre-K teacher so starting really young, because I want to do pre-K and up, I'm really mm -hmm. focusing on elementary. Mm -hmm. So um, if we start in elementary schools and just for social emotional well-being and how does that impact then? So basically we have recess, we have our mindful moment, and then we go right into reading. That's our schedule right now. So I want to, so I'm looking at and I'm creating like a baseline of kind of uh, behaviors like blurting, getting up out of the seat, how many times my mentor teacher is having to um, repeat directions. Um, and then I'm going to offer them a week of guided mindful practice mm -hmm. and kind of just look, I know there's a lot of variables for this, so it's a little tricky, but I just want to see if I, if even just in a week of offering them something, something really guided, mm -hmm. if I can see any differences in behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I still have a lot of digging to do in this. Yeah. Well, actually sounds good. Thank you, Michelle. That sounds very, you know, like you have a, a clear idea, a clear time frame. Um, and I think in some ways, and I always, I say this with all, uh, you know, respect to experience, looking in the literature helps it, it get, yeah. you know, that that's really an important thing that um, when you say we're doing all these practices uh, that gives you an opening to go ahead and make sure that you have uh, taken the time to do something like that. So that sounds great. How about um, James? How about you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure yet. It's funny. I, I looked at my lit review from 600 and uh, wanted to was kind of intrigued about continuing the conversation about technology and social studies classroom. You know, especially given the last year of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, and so I conducted uh, my interviews on that topic, and I, I think it left me. I felt I felt like it was kind of superficial if that makes sense. Like I felt mm -hmm. like the conversations I was having were, I mean, uh, I felt like I already knew sort of what was going to come out of those conversations as far as the way my colleagues were feeling. And, and then I've been thinking about, you know, maybe I need to look at this more as like from an, from an, like 
an engagement piece or I was trying to think about how I felt about my students and how it's been harder to get to know them. You know, technology is supposed to bring everybody close together, but it's also, you know, I find that there's something lost in the classroom environment when so many things are moved online. So I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling around with trying to find the right way to sort of mm -hmm. find out exactly where I want to go. I found the inter my interviews, you know, they, I thought the questions were purposeful and uh, the answers were great and everything was in, in kind of fell into time, so to speak, but I was sort of unsatisfied by what I was finding, like the data that I was getting. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like, I need to find some depth there that I'm not, that I, I don't have yet, <laughs> basically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes okay. sense. Yeah. Okay. And I think it, fair enough. Uh, and I asked you all to do interview questions really um, straight out and in, in many cases without a frame of reference. Um, and so really this might be a chance for us today to talk a little bit more about what we ask and how we ask and do the interviews so that we can, you know, and then also keep in mind, you know, your questions about what, what other kind of depth are you looking for? What is the hook? We're really, you know, trying to figure out what's the hook here. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. How about, how about, uh, let's ask Molly. I haven't heard from you, Molly. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? Great. Um, so I want to continue with my inclusion and how it's beneficial for students. Um, I guess I am struggling with how I'm going to show that because I don't have data, like I don't have solid data from students that were in like a pullout program or had a one-on-one -on -one last year to like this year that they don't have anything. Um, the only thing that I can think of would be like, like NWEA testing, but I'm not really sure if that would really show. Um, so I'm not really sure how I'm gonna show within like my research that it's been like, I can show like it's beneficial for the kids that I've seen, but like data, like quantitative data, I'm not really sure how I'm gonna show that. Yeah, and you might just ask yourself, what is it? I mean, the things that you've seen, what have you seen that say it's successful? Um, what are the so, what are five things you've seen that say it's successful? Um, a student that I have who has severe autism, his stemming has decreased greatly. Um, he's able to be in a classroom of 27 and um, talk to peers, participate, um, volunteer to participate, uh, completing all work. Um, and last semester when he was in a classroom of 12, he was stimming the whole class. He was not really participating. Um, and he didn't really complete much of his work. Yeah. So I think working with his peers has helped. And then he got more comfortable with more peers as the year has gone on. And maybe the time it's in a sense I'm getting the idea that maybe the time frame is too tight for you to do any to, to start now and say let's see what include the benefits of inclusion are. Yes. For, so for I'm others. not. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure how I can like twist it because I really do want like a topic that has like inclusion because mm -hmm. I I do think it's really beneficial. Yeah, yeah, well, and then, so let's think about, let me just, just kind of keep that, uh, you know, as an open question right now, see where you, you know, we'll come up with. How about um, Daryl how are you doing? What's your, your thought right now in terms well, of what you're looking I, at? Yeah, so I saw, and I went back and read my research literacy paper and try to pull stuff out. But I also sent survey questions out to three um, teachers, two full-time teachers, um, our music teacher, Jennifer Morrow. <laughs> and then um, also, cause I collaborate with her a lot. And then um, also a sub, a long-term sub this year because she's been in multiple classrooms. Um, and so, those five questions went out there. Like for my interview process, I interviewed my children based on the hybrid and college, comparing it to high school um, for practice primarily because I haven't really formally interviewed in a, in a long time. 
But I came up with five different questions and the one that I keep leaning towards that would be beneficial for the educational or alternative educational is how to ensure that the programming remains flexible and adaptive, adaptive to students, but also still offering high quality education in learning in that environment. So um, based on the five questions, I think I'm leaning towards that one because there are barriers, et cetera, but based on the answers that I've received so far from the teachers, um, I think that would be the better one to try to um, do some action research on. And it sounds like talking with teachers is what you're, where you're finding the most. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, they're very insightful because they, like some of them, you know, have 27, like for the music teacher, she would have all the students at once, so that was one. Then we have the other teacher that had not quite as many students, but the long-term sub was actually interesting because she's been in a variety of different classrooms, and so the questions like for barriers in, in a traditional classroom, she was very effective in answering, even though she didn't feel like she was, she did answer with a different perspective, which was really nice. So yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it's, so you know, I think that's a positive direction. If you feel like that's okay. working, great to see Jennifer so joined us. Thank you. Great. How about um, Kelly? How are you doing with your? Um, I think I have a sense of what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I wrote my paper last year about project-based learning, and it was fairly broad um, in terms of just kind of the outcomes. I think last year my paper was more about student um, engagement pieces. Um, so kind of co-currently as I wrote that paper last year, I designed a project-based learning opportunity for my students and put it in action um, at the end of distance learning last spring. Um, and part of what I did not enjoy about the experience from my end was I didn't get to see the process um, because they were all doing it at home independently and I wasn't actually part of it. Um, so this year I'm implementing the same project, but I will be a part of the process because they're going to do it at school. Um, so I do have something I can lean on. They're going to do it at school. It's project-based learning. And I think a bigger piece I'm looking for is a little bit more validation for the teacher's role in PBL and, and um, teacher's effort because I know it can be probably like 30 hours to design this project last year. So seeing is that that was a big investment of time. And if you're changing your curriculum to implement more project-based learning, I just want to know it's worth it. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's what I want to investigate. Great. And I, I think, you know, with, even with all the resources that have come out, even with, like you say, the, the people saying it works, it works. You still have to see it work. Yeah. Yeah, good. So I think good. that's my plan. Good point. Good plan. All right. Um, and let's see. Well, there'll be some other things to, to dig into there. Um, how about um, Danielle? What are you thinking? Um, let's see. I pulled up my 600 research project, and my topic is academic success. Uh, for students raised in poverty. And I think I may stick with that and kind of go off on a little bit of a different way. Um, I did a couple interviews yesterday and it was super interesting because for the lower grades, um, for the lower grades, people really wanted the team approach to help students raised in poverty and kind of level the playing fields in the classroom, like no birthday party celebrations, really kind of level it. And then as kids got older, like middle school and high school, it was more, um, I think I interviewed like six people, was more like a go-to person for contact. And because all of the, um, you know, free and reduced lunch information is completely confidential. Uh, the teachers can guess, but unless they're told by the student or the parent, they have no idea which children meet poverty level. Um, so I just, I find it fascinating that we have all these resources, but there's not a lot of communication around it to specifically help unless students ask for it. Um, Anyways, 
so I'm thinking that, or I can do a total 360 and completely ditch it and do something like, what is it going to take to get hired? Or uh, what are principals looking for? Because I, I have no idea. Um, but I don't know if I have the time and energy to, to do that because I'm a long-term sub in a first grade classroom. And I just don't know if I have the time to put that together. So the, 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 so it's really, every time you say that, you know, it'd be great to know what it is. I'm like, yeah, it would be good. That would be really good. <laughs> would, we'd love, all love to know what's going on. Yeah. Um, um, but I also, so it, it sounds like the one, on the one hand, the talking with teachers about how do you engage students from, who have the, the diversity of background has some resonance that we think about it and we do things. It, there might not be a policy, but in some cases there might be. So I would look for those things that have gone from, you know, kind of like the wisdom of practice to maybe identifying what are some actual policies. And, and that might be a way of leading you to, to something that, you know, gives you a sense of how, how we take those ideas and put them into place. And, okay. and put, uh, so that leader and leaders and teachers in, in all grade levels are saying, okay, this is what we're committed to. But I think there's just a point of, maybe sometimes it's, it's, it's worth just asking, you know, those kinds of questions. How do you do that? And let teachers, you know, help uh, us figure that out. I yeah, know. I mean, even, even as basic as uh, I celebrated um, St. Patrick's Day and nine out of the 13 kids got like these big treasures when they woke up in the morning and then four of them got nothing. And it was so, I, you know, it was so difficult to hear the kids saying, well, I didn't get any gold coins. I mean, and so I, you know, in my classroom, we're not celebrating anything because it was the, the range of celebration is crazy. Some kids get ten dollars for losing a tooth and some get a quarter i mean it's just crazy yeah well i think uh, and you know it, it, well it, i think it really does maybe maybe this is about what does celebration mean yeah, you know that's true what does it mean and how do we take that in a, in a sense to make it equitable and uh, less about what we don't have and more about celebrating the things that are meaningful for students yeah. i mean i was in a first grade classroom where the kids were just ab absolutely out of their minds cheering each other on every time they would talk about a math you know problem and they're just it's so it's so it's so palpable but it's different than did you get that dollar for your tooth yeah yeah right have we ever paid for a grade i have not ever paid for a grade okay i'm just telling you i made it as a parent <laughs> two kids <laughs> And I um, think that that's a, pretty, that's, a, that's a practice that gets us in trouble. How about you, um, uh, let's see, um, Raina, you were here. How about you, what's your thought now? Um, I want to apologize ahead of time. We have a puppy and he's making lots of noises. So. Okay, puppies are good. I'm okay with puppies. The pandemic puppy. Okay. Um, <laughs> They're even better. <laughs> well, this is not a pandemic baby, it's fine. Um, <laughs> So I think um, through my interviews, it was a really helpful activity. Um, when you assigned it last week, I, I had a little ego about it. I was like, oh, I'll be, I'll be great in this. And then <laughs> I, I interviewed me. It was horrible. Um, so thank you for the assignment. It was great. Um, so I think I want to research um, MFA programs, maybe just our local one, the Stone mm -hmm. program. Um, and I want to think about writing or teaching beyond the Iowa method, um, which is a is what a lot of MFA programs kind of adhere to. And what was that method called? It's called the Iowa method. Oh, and the Iowa was, method. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, developed by one of the first creative writing programs in the country in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I want to get a sense from students and alum around what writers actually need and um, maybe kind of come up with 
some cases that really served students well and maybe better than the Iowa method. Um, especially, I think I'm going to narrow it down to fiction students. And I don't know if I, I think I should narrow it down to MFA students, but I also kind of like the idea of including high school students too. Although my- um, Could we pause just question. a second here? Could I pause just a oh, second? Sure. Hold on. Does anyone want to see my puppy? All right, sorry. Well, now we're we're showing the puppy. Oh, oh, good, good, good move. Definitely good <laughs> move. Thank you for doing that. Isn't he so cute? Wow. He's like, wow. Oh, oh, he's got teeth. Uh, I see the teeth. Uh, okay. <laughs> So um, my question was um, that when, when we were in the 600 class, um, he taught us how to use the databases that the college has access to. Mm -hmm. And um, they were great for the topic that I was doing around K through 12 education. But um, I think I'm worried or kind of a little cautious. I don't, I don't have the experience of researching mm -hmm. um, databases that have to do with college programs. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think it's just a matter of, of, of seeing what what you can do and, and what, I'll, what, what, I, what I would like to do um, today as a wrap up is, is just go through and pull up the database and just walk through a search. But also exactly. in doing that, I also want to, 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 to you know, give you some other uh, directions you might go in to um, thinking through what kind of literature is out there um, and including, and I'll repeat this again and probably again, but we do have a reference librarian by the name of Tim Lynch. I'm going to put his name and his, I think, um, and I can put his email in here when, when I find it, but Tim Lynch is our university, our education um, liaison at UMaine, at University of Southern Maine Libraries. And I'll, I'll, um, come back to that, but he's uh, there and I can put up a couple of uh, librarians who know the work that goes on in my classroom and will be responsive to any questions that come from you um, in, in, and do that very quickly and efficiently. So I do understand what you're saying. And in some ways it's, it's, um, it's just a matter of going out there and, and uh, trying it, see what you can find. MFA to... programs are established. I mean, it's not like it's something right. that just came up yesterday. Right, right. And I also wanted to ask um, if if we can um, write with the mindset of I, I kind of want to try to publish this after this class is over. And so um, is there any anything else I should consider when doing those interviews or I, well, let's literature uh, review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, maybe I, I like to go at this from the mindset of, and, and I do believe that many of the actual research studies that are done in this class have some real uh, unbelievably valuable uh, starts to a publishable paper, if not something that gets down the road. Why? Because it's current. It's something that is just what I would say is at the bleeding edge of our thinking. And it's something that may not even be reflected back into the literature yet. I mean, you're putting things together now in a different way in a different time. I mean, it's so it's very, I think, encouraging. And I encourage you all, you know, take it. You, you're taking your writing seriously. I know. But Raina, you're taking it particularly seriously. And that's because that's your thing. Good. Well, I'm glad you're thinking like that. That makes a lot of that that affirms a lot about what we're doing and what you what you who you are and what you want to do so um i think that's we'll talk about that the more we go the one thing i can say is that i can play the best role through this through those uh, one page or three page or eight page or developments i can help put that you know you want more on a track if you want to go in that direction quicker the more Danielle, feedback i, I can give should, you i think you should do your principal idea and write an editorial in the Right, what? I think I did. 
<laughs> I think you should do your principal idea and then write an editorial for our local newspaper. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think a lot of people want to know. For real. I, yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I probably could collect a ton of data. Maybe I collect the data and then you write it for me. Sure. <laughs> You're the writer. <laughs> I'm great. Well, it is, it is, it is, it is fascinating because I think that is a topic that people would really like to hear more about. It's like, so what are we looking for? Yeah. Well, we just, well, we can, we'll get back to that. Let's go back. Let's go. Jennifer, how are you doing? Good. Hi. Yeah, so, good to um, see you. Oh, what was that? It's good to see you. Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, so I, am doing well i haven't really figured out exactly how i'm going to word it yet because after i was surprised by what i found out in the interviews um so my first my initial idea was about what barriers what what parents and teachers were finding as barriers to engagement based like coming from covid-19 sort of thing um but when I actually did the interviews, I was finding that the people were saying they found their students to be almost more engaged because it was small class sizes and more one-on-one -on -one instruction than before. So I was thinking that because of the pandemic, engagement would have been down, but it turns out from the people that I interviewed at least um, that they're finding their students to be more engaged so I am rewording my question. <laughs> um, well, just interesting. To, yeah, just to, I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to, instead of barrier, to kind of see if there's barriers, but more so um, wording it more openly. So instead of looking for barriers more, how has engagement been impacted by COVID? Mm -hmm. I guess. So I'm thinking of interviewing students, um, parents, and then teachers. And okay, so that's a great idea of doing all those. But I would say you need to really be cautious and limit that, the, like be mindful about how we want to design the number of students, maybe three students, three parents, three teachers. I mean, that's a maximum. Right. Right. And, but the, and the thing, so one of the people that I interviewed is both a parent and an educator. So she yeah. kind of had both. Um, okay. so, okay. All right. Well, that's really great. I'm glad. And, and it sounds like from what, uh, you have said and what I've heard from some others that the idea of, of uh, thinking about your topic and doing the interviews actually was a good way of immersing yourself in this. Um, I know yeah. we haven't, I, I, you know, I haven't done all the skill building around the interviews, but that's what we're going to do next. Right. Um, and I think that it really did kind of put another you know uh target out there a goal out there once you heard from teachers i mean you were just saying jennifer that's really a, that's really remarkable that you know you had a, a kind of a, a surprise there i love surprises but <laughs> it really was counter counterintuitive in a way right uh, maybe it was a function of the way you asked the questions maybe it's a way a function of how we're looking at things um and so um, maybe, I, and I just, hey, here's a question I've had that, that is maybe similar, that might be a, another way of probing that, is what do people think about the actual um, growth and development of students? Because I think there's, there's been a lot of chatter about how this has really damaged everybody. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking, well, maybe, but maybe not. Right. You know. One of the people that I interviewed mentioned how he thought that students were almost more appreciative of what they have being at school because that was taken away from them last mm -hmm. March. So kind of a perspective that most people didn't have growing up, like in elementary mm -hmm. school, that we don't get to go to school sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's definitely interesting. Well, it is. And I, so I think we'll, you know, it will benefit us to, to at least um, think about and, and to create some um, good evidence around these findings. So, okay. Very. And is there any other 
so we've kind of gone through everyone. What I wanted to do now is to create, um, let's see, maybe create two groups and have you talk about uh, two things. Um, one of them would be, what was it like for you as you were designing the interview and putting the interview questions together? Uh, and the other one is, what was your experience during the interview? As you were actually doing the interview, what were your, what are your reflections on the kinds of things? So the first thing is, you know, in terms of preparation and que and question and questions you asked. You know, how did you how did you prepare? And and what I love about interviews is, no matter how I prepare for them, they're so unique. Every one of them is such a unique experience. I'm like. I, I could read the script, but even if I read a script, the experience of interviewing means I need to interact. I need to look you, I need to look at you. I need to think about, is there a follow-up question or is there something that I see in your body language or something else? So talk about that experience of being the interviewer with each other and take some time to, and we'll come back and debrief that and I'll give you I think uh, 20, 20, at least 20 minutes to talk about this, 20 to 25 minutes to talk about this, because this is really an important um, way for us to get at the idea of constructing the interview, which I'm hoping you're thinking is an action research step. I'm going to go back and hone these questions or maybe tool them up. I think, James, this is where, you know, you're trying to find the combination or you're trying to see the depth or is it more about what is it? Uh, there and and others are seeing other opportunities, but I think that there's also a part of as qualitative interviews, we also need to talk about our experiences as researchers. We need to be able to be more transparent about who we are and how those processes work. Um, so let me just stop there. So any is that clear enough? Good. Okay, so I'm going to put you into two groups let you go. I'll bounce back and forth between the group, the two, and uh, let's um, talk about interviews. Um, so I tell you what, why don't, if you want to take like a, a two minute, three minute break, turn it on, turn it on. If you need to step away for three minutes, go right ahead. I'll do the groups and we can reconstitute, we come back together, you know, in three minutes. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Professor, I just I'm going to log off with my computer and log on on my phone. Is that okay. okay? That way I can go in the group. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Sure.
we were talking um, and then was able to watch. It, it didn't catch as much because it was a recording on myself, but I still was able to like hear her responses and add that to what I had typed down during the interview. What do you mean so like I, a recording on yourself? Um, so on, you know how you have just the, on laptops, they have like the photo booth. Um, I just had that recording myself during. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So it picked up our conversation yeah. um, all on me the whole time. So. And so was it like a Zoom or in person? In person. Oh, so it yeah. wasn't like self-conscious. Right. It was, yeah, it was just, so she wasn't actually even in it at all. It was just for my own viewing. So that's a good, that's a good yeah. idea. I thought it worked out. only did like stills. It does videos too. Oh, yeah. I didn't even so you're like sitting in your own interview booth. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> oh, I mean, that's, yeah, not a bad way to go. Yeah, it worked out. I think my biggest thing for my interview was I need my next, my, you know, interviews for my paper to be less of an interrogation and more of a conversation because <laughs> I feel like, wow, I have no experience doing this. And I went in with my list and it, like, I'm really comfortable with talking with people. So like, I'm not shy at all. I'll, you know, I'm really good at like getting thoughts across and in the moment and stuff. But for this, it's like, jammed me up in a way like yeah yeah like I said to you guys before it just it was too like formal and I didn't I like realized when I was transcribing it I didn't respond back like I don't know so definitely a learning curve there yeah I noticed my like I I know I knew I know my interviewers like pretty or my interviewees pretty well and I noticed they were very robotic well, I guess this, the one on, yeah. yeah, the one on Marco Polo wasn't so much, but my partner who was sitting right there, she was just like, yes, <laughs> yes. I have taught English. <laughs> okay, this is, yeah, mine were the same. They were, and it's like my mentor teacher I've been with all year. And so, and we get along yeah. really well. And it, she sounds robotic in it too. It's funny, right? Yeah. One of uh, my interviews was actually um, a colleague that I had been on the interview panel for his job position. So like I was having flashbacks while interviewing him with <laughs> that like coldness, like because I also feel like I came across cold. And also as soon as I clicked stop, like we continued talking about that, like what we talked about in the interview and I shared insights from, because we team teach at, or we, um, we're common planning at my school. So we all teach the same thing. So it's nice knowing my team teachers are on board with what we're gonna do for their project. Um, but so I was talking about my other team teachers interview and how I was like, she came across so like nervous and he was, and so we just talked about that and I got some good insights from our debrief, but I was like, I wasn't recording that. This was the conversation we were having as a follow-up. and. I know you can put those in memos though, right, Jeff? Yes, yes, definitely. You know, the recorder is always turning, you know, it might not be verbatim, but I think one of the things that is, you know, fair game uh, for researchers, if you say someone you're, I'm interviewing, whether you have a machine on or off doesn't really determine the things that you're taking away from it. Yeah, no, I look, I have the same, I have the same thing. I, I look at my transcripts of the way I talk and I, an interview is a different experience. So it's really good to have that and to reflect on it so that you have the, you know, that you can start to at least see yourself, but also see how your questions and all those things that you really want to have, you know, and are really excited about you don't get lost in the shuffle or get that robotic, you know, you know, I, I remember I was supposed to interview someone for uh, 20 minutes once they said, get, you know, put a 20 minute interview on. Well, at the end of 10 minutes, we were done. It's like, so what do I do now? <laughs> and that is what you have to do is figure out. So what do I do now? 
Say more about the memo. What it, what is that? Well, a mem and and, Den and good point that you brought that up, Michelle, because a, a memo is a thought about your interview that might be happening. Because I think there's a lot of parallel thinking that and parallel experience that goes on. So that's when this idea of you kind of becoming the interviewer, but also at the same time thinking about what you're interviewing. So you've got these dual processing and multi kind of multi-layered processing ideas going on. And one of the things that is useful there is to have a place to put that. So if you feel uncomfortable in an interview or you feel anxious, say, I'm feeling anxious. It might just be like, this is, you know, I'm having a moment here or in this moment, I'm actually thinking about something else. Let me jot it down, but I'm asking this or I'm seeing, you know, and again, it's, it's one of those things that's a, um, a prod to your memory but also could be a way of seeking different in, you know, levels of interpretation of the data itself. And even when you're, yeah, go ahead, Dan, did you want to say do something? You have, do you have like a, like a study that has one of those in it? That, that has memos, them? if we, well, if you look at in, the, um, in the, the data analysis section in the textbook, there are examples oh, cool. of memos. And, and of the, the, what we call the bracketing thinking that, you, that takes place. Nice. And um, it's, it's, it's a, even a, a, an additional way of looking that, at this would be at the outset, what you wanna to try to do with your interview data, and we're gonna take the next two weeks to do this, is to start to interpret the data. Well, you might have multiple levels of interpretation going on simultaneously. And you might wanna stop one by saying, I'm gonna write a memo because I'm jumping way too far, way too fast. And I need to immerse myself in the data, but I don't wanna lose this idea now. So here I'm gonna put, it's like I'm putting a post-it onto this um, so that I can have another uh, way of referring back to what my thought, you know, my thought process is. An inter qualitative interviewing and qualitative analysis is not a straight line. I mean, you're, that's one of the other things. It's really, unless you have an interview that's so formulaic, yes, no, numbers, those kind of things, which I don't think you, you might have those. Um, it's, it's not something that's a straight line. It's multi-layered, it's, you know, back, you know, to me, whether you want to call it iterative or back and forth or multi-layer, I mean, it, it, uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting, Raina, you've been talking about fiction, right? And I call qualitative work almost fiction. Yeah, it's almost, <laughs> it's, not, it's not fiction. It is, you are really trying to capture reality, but you're yeah. still having to construct it. Yeah. So it's it's all. I it's my thought. It's it's almost fiction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Michelle. Can I just ask something real quick? Just kind of going off that. It's a little bit off topic from the interview, but just really fast. While I'm doing, while I'm collecting data right now to just kind of establish a baseline in my classroom, when I'm observing kind of the like when I'm literally writing down like tallies for kids getting up out of their seat when they're not supposed to and yeah. that kind of thing. What kind of data is that? I was just thinking real quick in the moment, like. It's, it's mean, observational data. It is okay. So, so it still but, but, would be qualitative then. Well, it's, it? it's it's qualitative. So when you when so it's quantitative. When you're tick marking something, it's quality. It's right. quantitative because you're right. clearly de dealing with numbers and proportions right. and preponderance and that kind of thing. But if you were to say, and, and I'm going to write a paragraph about what it looked like. That's right. that's qualitative. So if okay, and that's yeah, where my confusion in my brain is happening. I'm like, okay, but I feel like it's quantitative because I'm I'm like keeping track of mm -hmm. yeah, like numbers, but but I'm going to interpret the data, and like you said, it's kind of like fiction in a way. I'm like interpreting it because there's so many variables here. You know, right. there's kids that are going to jump out of the seat no matter what's happening on any you know given day, or or because something else is happening earlier in the day, and so the mindfulness stuff's not going to matter. So well, well, maybe, but maybe mindfulness matters, but it, it's not. It's not going to be that they jump out of their seat. Maybe they're feeling different. I mean, in mindfulness and equating right. mindfulness and and kids having the sense of of movement. I don't know. I'm. It's it's an interesting question to think about. Yeah. You know, mindfulness is okay. going to have other kinds of of 
I think, um, meaning with students that you're on the quest. I mean, that's what you're looking for. Right. Um, maybe it comes out, you know, maybe they jump out of their seat, but maybe they do better reading. Right, exactly. Okay, great. Well, this is good. I'm gonna, let me just check in with the other group and I'll be right back. And then we'll close up here in about five minutes. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you. There's sort of, like you said, Rye, like there were still moments where I had to go back and like, you know, I'm, I'm reading it and I'm like, this is not right, <laughs> you know, but it was, uh, you know, for each interview, there might have only been like, uh, you know, two or three and all and, and the interviews like I was pretty lucky, like they all, uh, you know, I think the one was six minutes and the other two were both about five. So it was, you know, and and as sort of like as Jeff kind of said, actually, like, or, or I can't remember if it was Jeff for the book, uh, you know, sometimes, no, it was Jeff, sometimes like transcribing them, uh, actually, you know, it's good, you sort of get into it a little bit, you know, gets you re-engaged in the, in the process, but yeah, so Otter is the name of that, and uh, I thought it worked uh, pretty well, and I was having some real, I was having some real issues getting it to send, though, to another, like, to be able to put put it into the Google doc. There was some like some tech troubles, but then I found that air dropping it ended up being the right thing, but it took me far too many hours. <laughs> to figure that out. I used an app called dictate oh. and it like literally as I'm interviewing the person, it would like do it all for me and then, um, or type it all in for me. And then that was on my computer. Um, and then it will, you can export it out and it will share speaker one, speaker two, um, that sort of thing. But it will also um, do the timestamp as well. Um, and I did not have as many errors. Like it did do quite a lot of. Um, and that, the, that app was called Dictate? Dictate, yeah. Um, and so the, then I had sent my one of my surveys to Jana who does we you know our presentation last week um which I'd probably would love to interview her in person as well we just couldn't make the time up to do so but um at this time and she said she used sonics or something like that to um because all of my interviews and dictate wound up being together because I also did James as well but um not very not very verbal um and so I had to go and I have Adobe Suite. So I used um, Adobe Auction or um, Audition to like split up my different interviews. And so then they became MP4s or MP3s and then I could share them. So, I mean, I'm sure that there's something else. Sonic, so you can have for like 30 minutes free um, and it will do it for you. But I struggled with like separating. I needed, and I am a creative suite person, but like, I did like separate my, cause they were all together and dictate. So if you do dictate, you just have to remember that if you do more than one and dictate, it might keep both of them back to back. Mm -hmm. um, but you would still have different speakers. It was like, just continue to be a speaker four, speaker five, speaker six, oh, cool. you know, that sort of thing. So, so yeah. the, the, the time stamping thing and then the speaker one too, that's going to be important. Like Jeff shared in the Google folder, if you haven't had a chance to see that, the next step example is the timestamp when people speak and then keywords, James. So like, yeah, yeah. You, you might be quite ahead of the game now because there's like yeah. key words and phrases that came out. Yeah, I'm to I'm I feel I totally I screwed. I like copy and pasted it. <laughs> I, I don't know this, this would have been helpful last week. Don't you think like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I feel because yeah. I, I have everybody's think, ideas. Yeah, share their ideas on how to transcribe and all that. That would have been so helpful. But well, we're not done yet, Danielle. Uh <laughs> well, this is just the beginning. This is okay. This is what it takes to get this thing all all out there. So 
So yeah, so Danielle, so I just happened like because Jana's presentation was outdoor um, learning, right? And she said she's all set. And so I just kind of emailed her and I was like, um, there's not many like examples of how to like do this. And so she just shared. So that kind of helped her out a little bit. So yeah. Oh, that's awesome. You're so resourceful. <laughs> right. Well, and, and that's another thing, another good, uh, you know, uh, I think way of doing this is to have that, you know, a resource like that. But um, part that that's, we'll, we'll try to fold as much of that into the class as we can as quickly as possible. So yeah, Daryl Ann, I'll have you talk about that. And, you know, uh, also the, the idea of how do we make the technology you know, master this so it's not creating the, the three hour time <laughs> sink that we all fall into. You know, I do the same thing. Good. Well, this is, this is a little bit of a different conversation than we had with the other group. Um, so let, let's go, take this back. Um, and, and did you all get a chance to talk about your experiences as interviewers and setting up the questions? It sounded like that was, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. Yes. So let's let's uh, do a, a debrief on this when we get back to the big group, and then we'll um, talk about the analysis part next. Okay. So I'm gonna close the rooms, and we'll see you back in the big room in a minute. See everyone's coming back from the breakout rooms. That's, is everyone? I think it looks like we're all back here. Great. Well, um, there was some terrific conversations that took place. I was glad to see that that um, the interviews themselves were, I think, good experiences for people to have. I think there's lots of levels of of uh, becoming more familiar with the interview process and yourself as interviewers. So let's just have a couple of things uh, from each group, maybe some of the uh, a take two takeaways. So uh, if, if uh, group one, uh, with Michelle and Raina and Jen and Kelly, what, what is, some of you like to take a lead on that and just, um, talk a little bit about one thing that you took away from that first question you know, of prepping for the interview. And second group, we'll talk about the, your experience. Um, one of the things that we talked about was <clears throat> um, preparing for the interview, um, not kind of finding a balance between going in with questions, um, so scripted questions and um, going in kind of just conversation based um, because it led to different responses in terms of robotic almost responses and questions being asked. So that was one of the things we talked about was finding a balance between knowing exactly what you're going to say and kind of winging it sort of thing. So. Mm -hmm. And I heard you also talk a little bit about, you know, the the idea that of turning on a recorder or saying I'm recording this was one thing and then turning off the recorder and the conversation continuing after, I think that was something that Kelly mentioned that, that um, you might wanna just say something about um, and, how, and what we talked about there. Right, um, part of that was that there's also, you're recording, even when you're not recording, you're subconsciously recording, I guess, in your own way. Um, so the fact that the interview that was recorded wasn't necessarily the whole interview. And there is meaning in what happens afterwards, just the debriefing and 
the conversation that continues after the recording piece in the formal interview is over, that there's still a lot that can come from the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you mentioned, I think the other thing that um, we'll talk about in terms of the experience of the interview was the idea of what's a memo, um, you know, and how do you, how do you add that um, reflective thinking to your data and uh, a memo is a strategy for doing that as a reflective moment or even during an interview if, if you really have something that you're you know um, you know really is relevant or is maybe important but not absolutely connected to what you're talking about you can you know make sure that you annotate that or memo that to yourself um, to try to just make sure that you don't forget ideas or that you situate, you can kind of reconstruct the moment and, and uh, again, come back to it in a, in, a, in a more, in a deeper way. It's kind of like if you're recording the interview, you could also be taking notes to write down those pinned ideas. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think about that when I was interviewing, I just was recording and mm -hmm. I was like, oh, the recording will just get it. But I should have, I, or I could have had paper in front of me with a pen. Yeah, I would suggest that that's a good strategy to have. I mean, I couldn't do it. I can interview, but I'm such a compulsive note taker um, and, it, and a memo person that I wanna make as much use of the time as I can. So it's kind of like compressing this all um, and I'll take notes in any one of a number of different ways. I'll do, I'll map out the interview. I can concept map an interview of big ideas. So I'm not worried about quotes or if I like to quote, I'll put it in and then just, you know, make a mess out of a page really um, in doing so. And then go back and then that cleans up and it all works to clean that up. So group two, I wanted to start with um, Daryl and I know, I, again, this is one of those things I, uh, Danielle was saying, I wish I'd have known about all these recording things before I did this interview, <laughs> but I don't. So this is a, we're trying to catch up here and make sure that we learn from each other. So Daryl, and talk a little about your recording uh, adventure. Sure. So I didn't really know. I mean, I do have voice recorder on the phone, but I also noted, noticed that we needed to like have the text. So I, um, our present, our presenter last week, I reached out to her because I noticed that there weren't any examples of what we could possibly use and effectively. And she offered what she did, which was, um, I think it's called Sonics, but I had an issue with that because I used Dictate, um, the app, and that did a really good job with like, applying everything with my interviews and like the text was really spot on there was very little grammatical errors and stuff like that um but it would continue so let's say if i had one interview even though i would export that interview my second interview would be included so that was a struggle so um i wanted to separate them so they would be separate audio tapes or whatever for the lack of a better word and then i um so I am a creative suite individual with Adobe and I used Adobe Audition to split up my, um, my voice recordings. Um, and then dictate also timestamps and it will share, you know, speaker one, speaker two, speaker three, speaker four for you. And so I could just go ahead and put in names after that. That was really the only thing I had to change. Everything else was pretty spot on as far as like text wise. It, except my only hiccup was that all of my interviews were merged together and I wanted them split so that. And my one, yeah, a good, good point. My one uh, uh, tech tip would be uh, using Zoom um, mm -hmm. because it exports to MP4 it um, as text and, or as, as a MP4, but it also, if you want to turn on the closed caption, it will export as text okay and it's a it's accessible and free um so 
Uh, you're right. Uh, one of the things I, I need to spend time um, and, and hope maybe this semester is the one to do that would be to really coming up with a, with a folder of these are the tech suggestions I have. Mm -hmm. It's just that there, there are so many and I'll, I've relied on Zoom, I have to tell you. That's okay. been where my main, um, you know, source of technology has been. So it's good to good to know. And I think it, um, it it's part of what we would like to see in the interviews, although you might find yourself doing an interview where you don't have technology. So be prepared to sit down and rewrite and re as your recollections allow you what happened. And this is part of the conversation that I had with the the group uh, when Raina was is she's been talking about fiction you know you're, you're reconstructing what happened it's you're trying to be as um credible and trustworthy as possible um and yet you're it's an interpretive experience for you uh, as you're doing this and i jokingly but i also feel this call qualitative research almost fiction it's it's not exactly transcription of reality nor is anything so there is a, an artistic side to this that is good to know that you can use metaphors you can use other means of interpreting data uh, and we'll talk about those uh, which are multidisciplinary ways of looking at data uh, the arts we turn to the arts quite a bit for this but i just want to let you know that um, there is a interpretive phase so now we're You've, you've experienced the data collection phase. Now we're looking at how do we interpret this data. And so um, we'll have two weeks until uh, that first skill building activity is due as an interpretation. And again, you're, you're getting your uh, initial kinds of experiences with it, but the analysis or the, the interpretation of that first one using that coded format isn't due until um, June 8th. So that's, you have a couple of weeks to ruminate, marinate, think on this. You might even, you know, if you want to do another interview, include another one as this, that's fine. As James said, I'm trying to get to the space where I'm really finding what I look, want to, to, uh, to, to analyze. So we have time to do that. And the interview um, template is something that's evolved from last semester to this semester, but it's in the Google folder or the, um, and I hope you've all had a chance to see the Google folder with the interview um, template and the uh, transcription. And so if you look in the Google folder, let me just do this. What you're gonna, what you're going to do is take the, these are these are somewhat different let's see accelerate summer one okay let's see on a second i'm trying to make sure i have the right here we go i think this is the one i have in there but i'm going to make sure so i altered the the folder so this is the template that i'd like to work with this this is kind of something we've come up with but what you can do in the meantime is with the interviews that you want to settle on you just transcribe put your transcription of your interview in this first column on the left and then um, we'll, uh, I'll, I've been working with just how we go through the interview analysis, and I've, this is more in line with what is in the textbook. And what I would say that one of the most important steps that you can do in anticipation of that is to look at your interview and to pick out from the interview, to, you know, say for a five minute interview, you might pick out four or five quotes and really zero in, really, you know, stress yourself out good. 
figuring out what are the best things that represent these ideas. Because uh, the, the direct quotes are the, the, the link back to the data that also then is possibly used in the write-up of the interpretation. So using quotes in an interp your, your interpretation and your analysis is an expected way of, of uh, taking the data, qualitative data and using it to explain your results. So if you're looking at um, the ways in which, say, James is looking at technology and teachers, you might have some quotes from teachers who seem to have a, a particularly uh, helpful way or uh, in-depth way or something that connects their uh, teaching of social studies with uh, the use of technology here in the quotes. Uh, and then the idea of these categories, and this gets to the reading we did today on the predetermined versus emergent categories. Predetermined categories might be uh, something I was, it's interesting that, um, that we were talking, who is it was talking about, um, oh, Jennifer, you were talking about the fact that you were surprised by some of the interviews and used, used the words barrier here. So barrier was a predetermined category, but there was an emergent category, something that you weren't expecting, or you might say, you might say, it, you know, was a, in the interview, wasn't part of that expectation. So barrier, you might uh, link with part of the interview in which they were talking about barriers, but the other, the flip side of that, the, the, um, the, the, the surprise or the, the um, in, increased engagement might be something that would be uh, an emergent category or something that was unanticipated. Again, it, it, the, the predetermined category has a lot, has, has a, a, a strong connection with the kind of reading that you're doing or the things that have been um, suggested by authors in the field. And emergent categories have to do with things which come out of your data, which might be more unique or un unanticipated. And you're trying to really look back at the text in the interviews. And we'll have, um, I need to look in the textbook. The textbook does a good job of explaining the two predetermined and emergent categories. That um, I guess in chapter seven of Ravid. But that'll come. I think the, the thing that, that it always strikes me is it's important to keep reading and using what you read and constructing what I would say is a, this what we said was the, the conceptual framework or this these sets of predetermined categories and your that framework that you're looking from, like um, Michelle is looking at mindfulness for early childhood. You know, that's the framework. And then in within that, there are some determined categories like one of the things we're looking at is um, you, you mentioned over a number of times is students mobility. You know, well, how does that enter into this conversation? I know we're so um, let me let me just stop here and ask if there's um, some questions we're not doing this. This is this we're going to fill this in over the next two weeks. So think about what this is. Read those sections in the in the textbook, um, and we'll bring that back um, next week with some uh, more um, examples of how this works. And you'll have an idea of, you know, how your data might uh, certainly fit into the first category. The direct quotes is the, I think, very um, important step to take there. And then this becomes the, the categories and codes becomes the interpretive step. This last category would, uh, the last uh, column, I'm sorry, is for um, looking across three or four or five or six interviews. What are the things that are common to all those? Yeah, Ryan? Uh, I, I think I understand this. Uh, my question is, if I'm choosing a topic, I'm definitely choosing a topic that is different from what I researched and did literature reviews for EDU 600, mm -hmm. should I, should I start to research literature in the databases and start to find yeah. um, primary sources? Yes. Yeah, I know that that adds a little, uh, an extra 
um, uh, task there, but but the answer is yes. And I think the, the literature, re, it's, it's a matter of looking, and let me just sh show you really quickly within Brightspace that um, we do have um, in, let me go there and I can flip this on real quick. In module one, in module one, we have this web page that has the textbook and the databases. And I hope, I, I think I've heard from many of you that you've been able to see the textbook, but I'm going to show you. Click on that, and that takes you to this mini web page that I had constructed for. That's used. I use in a number of courses. It might have already been something you used in 600. And here is the textbook, and here is the database. Um, and um, so, if you wanted to strictly use that database, then it's same kind of of database that you uh, and format that you'd use before. So, do you all see the database format here? Okay. So then it would be the topic, and you might be doing something like you said, um, what you said, physical education. Yeah, diversity, equity, and inclusion practices, okay. best practices. In, okay, so we'll go diversity. Um, well, uh, and say equity, we'll put those two words there. Let's see, diversity. It was going to do that. This become so linking those with sports or PE. Ideally, I'd like to. I'd like a topic that focuses on phys ed, but I. I you okay, know, let's I, just I, I, let's just let's do that. I'm, I'm. You know, this is you know break break the thing. Yeah, I do wonder if 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 those top if you know if those two pieces of content you know athletic sports phys ed can those be used synonymously? I, I wonder that. Um, this is something that looks interesting, a whitewash curriculum construction of race and contemporary PE curriculum policy that comes in pretty high. I mean, in terms of like, that's a big topic, but it also is exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that, that's very much something I think a lot about recently too, is how, I just took curriculum development. I, you know, I got like five classes done over the last year to mm -hmm. get to this point and in the curriculum development class, I thought a lot about, you know, historical influences, cultural, social influences on curriculum and well, without really you know, taking if, too, yeah, without going too far. I mean, just do, doing diversity, equity, and inclusion and in physical education. I would say that there's five things right there. I only found 10, but 10 really good ones. Or maybe nine. I don't know about the uh, physical therapy. Maybe. Yeah. You go. Ten you know, and there was that whole thing that happened with, you know, during March Madness and the men's basketball and their facilities, women's basketball and their facilities and how that was quite, yeah, yeah. quite glaring, uh -huh. the inequity that that uh, existed there. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a you know pretty relevant topic and, and teaching here in Nashville and has been pretty eye opening and pretty cool and has really got yeah. me excited about this topic. And we just had a, another three hour workshop today with nine school districts in Southern Maine. 60 people talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have some raging, raging issues that are happening with pushback from communities, serious pushback from communities. And, you know, what do we, what do we do? Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged by that. So that's, that's, I think, uh, you know, you just do use these resources and we'll be, um, be all set. So next for next week, um, all the we're going to be talking about data analysis. So that qualitative data analysis, and we'll also do a little bit of foreshadowing of, of survey work. I don't want I can't we can't really take long, too long. But next week will really be more of an in depth. How do we analyze qualitative data? Uh, as I said, if you want to continue, you can use these two interviews that you did. Or if you think your methodology and your study is going to uh, be using more 
interviews, by all means, go. Don't wait to write a proposal. That we're not writing a proposal. You're designing this as an action resource. That means this is going to be a little bit of an unfolding process. So the first unfold is gonna be due next week. That's your one pager. So that's the first fold that we take and then we, and we do more complex origami and we have a three fold and then we do a little bit more complex and we have a, uh, something that's that in which you can then fill out your, your methodology of your study. Now, if you're, if you're moving ahead and you want to do some, does some survey design or something like that, then uh, you can send me your ideas you have. Your first one pager can be more about here's an idea I have or here's something I'm doing. Or you can just go ahead and uh, give me a shout out and I can help you do that uh, on, uh, you know, by email. Good. Okay, so we're a little bit over time. I'd like to wrap it up today. I uh, will... Um, Look forward to seeing you all. Uh, the one pager is, is, a, is a great uh, way to, to really um, put a benchmark uh, in this course. So I'm looking forward to, to reading those. I, in a sense, I already have an idea of where you're going, although I think some of you are still maybe thinking about how can I make this work, but so far so good. All right, well, take care, have a great week. I'll see you um, in June. Have Thank a great you. Memorial. Thank have you. a great Bye -bye. Memorial Day. Thank Bye. you all so much. Yeah, have a good Thank weekend. You. Bye. 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 Bye.